Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Mosley, for that wonderful song. If you ever wanted to understand the Passover, there you go. That's the, the beginning and the end of that. I appreciate you coming back tonight uh, after the difficult message this morning. And I uh, appreciate your, your faithfulness and being here in God's house uh, and to open God's word and to study God's word. So let's go directly to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and we're going to look at chapter 2 tonight. Nehemiah chapter 2. And we're going to remind ourselves of what we talked about last Sunday night. And that is the fact that uh, we were needing, if we're going to rebuild God's house, which is definitely the need for the hour, uh, we are not the only ones. Uh, we're not the only church that needs to be rebuilding itself. Uh, we don't, we're not the only ones that need God's help to kind of lift us out of COVID and, and the global pandemic. Everyone I talk to is in the same type of type of situation. Uh, everyone that I talk to, all my preacher friends and, and other people that I know to go that good, to good Baptist churches and other kind of churches, it's, it's, this is kind of a, a, a global thing, uh, not even just in America. There's a lot of missionaries that are they're struggling with their churches. And so I think that we're all find our, we all find ourselves in the same boat as church people and, and people of God that want God's church to grow. Amen. We don't want to sit here and go backwards. We certainly don't want to uh, lose ground uh, to this culture and to our enemy, and we want to make sure that we go forward. And so I think we all have that hard attitude. And we talked about the, la the fact uh, uh, last uh, week about what Nehemiah did to begin to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, the very first thing that he did was that he began to pray. And that's what we need to do. We need to begin to, to pray. And, and not only was it just that he prayed, he prayed a very specific prayer. He prayed a revival prayer is what I'm calling it. Uh, and we looked at the fact that it was a, a prayer that began with a burden. And we've got to have a burden for the people around us. And if you, if you captured anything from that message this morning, you can't help but have a burden for those people that are walking around in our shopping center and, and going to the restaurants and going to the gas station and that live next to you. Uh, if there's any chance of them going to the hell that we described today, you have to have a burden for them. And we talked about it has to burn with compassion. It has to burn with a compassion. You have to almost put yourselves in their, in their shoes and understand uh, their plight and understand where they're coming from. And, and how confusing, now let's just be honest, how confusing this religious world must be to the average person. Uh, there is so much out there and so much that circulates. And how would they ever understand and know for sure what was the truth? The, the revival prayer is definitely built on confession. And we have to understand that we are as guilty as everyone else, that we haven't done everything right through the pandemic. We, we have gotten uh, centrally focused and focused in on our own selves and all these different things that basically Nehemiah was in the captivity and he had done everything God told him to do. However, he still confessed his sins along with the rest of the nation. And then it was based on the promises of God, Amen. This revival prayer has to be based on the promises of God. God said he will build his church. The Lord said, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And God said that uh, he will bring the increase, that we're co-laborers with God. We work together with him, and as we work together with God, he will give the increase. And so we talked about a, a lot about revival prayer last Sunday night, and we even had some revival prayer up here in the front, and it was a wonderful service. Now, I want you to understand something very quickly, that when we transition from Nehemiah chapter 1 to chapter 2, there is a three-month interval, okay? There's 90 days that happen between chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so you have to understand, and this is, I think, where we fall down a little bit. You have to understand, Nehemiah didn't just pray revival prayer, and then bam, everything started happening. Okay? What actually happened was, Nehemiah prayed some revival prayer. He prayed and fasted for three days, and he prayed uh, uh, constantly throughout this three-month process. But what happened was, he prayed revival prayer. He had a burden. He confessed his sins. He based it on God's promises, and then he went back to work the next day, and he served the king. And he tasted the wine, and he tasted all the food, and he was the, the king's cupbearer. And he began to just go through his daily routine, 
keeping his revival prayer alive and keeping it going. And every day he sat, sat down, he kneeled down, he, he, he prostrated himself, whatever he did in his fashion of prayer. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And basically, to all appearances, nothing happened. But God was working. And so three months passed by, and then we see in verse 1 of chapter 2. Watch this. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took, Nehemiah says, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. Now, now watch, this has been going on so long, and, and Nehemiah's had the burden for so long, that now his countenance, he just can't help it, he's sad. He keeps going in and out of the presence and into the, uh, the chamber of the king. And he keeps going into the throne area. And he can't help but he can't fake it anymore. It's just it's showing up on his face. His anxiety and his burden and his desire to help the people in Jerusalem is showing up on his countenance, as the Bible says it. And he couldn't help it but be sad in front of the king. Now you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, it was a big deal back then. Because the king doesn't want any sad people around. And whatever the king says goes, and if he don't like your face, or you don't, he don't like your jokes, or he don't like the way you're acting, then he just take you out and kill you. And so Nehemiah is a little worried now, because he can't hide his, his burden, and he can't ha hide his heart and his sadness for his people in Jerusalem. But he comes in the king's presence every time that he's called and summoned, and then he's worried about what the king's going to react and how he's going to react to Nehemiah's sadness, because he's never been sad before. And what a Christian testimony that that is. All this time that he's been working for the king and been the king's cupbearer, he's never one time come in with a sound countenance. He's always been happy and joyful. Wherefore, the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? Now, if he'd had COVID, we'd understand why he doesn't look so good, but he's not sick. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart, this, the king says. Then, Nehemiah says, I was sore afraid. I was very sore afraid, uh, and I don't know what's about to happen. And he said unto the king, let the king live forever. Now, that's what you always say to kings. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Now, Nehemiah has no choice but to just share the burden with him. Nehemiah's just got to confess and get it out in the open and says, look, I'm not sad because I lost my dog. I'm not sad because I lost my girlfriend. I'm sad because of what's going on with my people and the city of Jerusalem. Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? Hmm, now wait a minute. Now that's a turn of events. Three months, nothing's happened. And Nehemiah goes into the palace and into the court of the king, and he's sad. And the, the king says, hey, what is wrong with you, Nehemiah? You've never been sad before, and I know you're not sick, so what's going on? And he tells him of the burden. And then the king sits on his throne and says, so what do you need from me? Now, how did that happen? You know, Persian kings don't normally offer Jewish people anything to rebuild their city. But now notice that Nehemiah is not just going to jump on here. Okay? I mean, if I was Nehemiah in this position, and I'd been praying for three months, revival prayer, and the king says, hey, what do you need? I'll give you whatever you need. I'd be like, all right, what I need now is I need a thousand workers. I need some cement. I need some wood. Are you with me? That's what I would have done. But Nehemiah doesn't do that. So I pray to the God of heaven, he says. So Nehemiah just says, King, I'll get back to you. And he goes back into his chamber, wherever he prays all the time. And he goes back and prays and said, God, what am I supposed to ask for? And I said unto the king, when he comes back, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, I'm not sure why that's in parentheses, I'm not sure why that's important, but it's in there. For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? Now that's, that's also interesting, because the king is not worried about what he's got to do, or how he's going to do anything over there in Judah. He's just saying, well, so Nehemiah, 
how long are you going to be gone? Uh, can you picture the relationship that he must have had with the king? If that's the first question the king asked, hey, Nehemiah, how long are you going to be gone? We, we're going to miss you around here. You know, we don't want you to be gone too long now. So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So they discussed the time and looked at all the kingly calendar. And if it looks anything like our church calendar, it took a while to find a date where they could send him. <laughs> Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. So what we need first is some military assistance. Uh, what we need now is we need somebody to help me get over to Judah, and, and I need some, some people that will help me get across the river, and I need some people that will help me get to Judah. Uh, I don't want to go on my own, Nehemiah says. And then he says, and you know, um, I mean, I can just see Nehemiah kind of him hawing around, and, and, and should I ask, should I not ask? Uh, is he going to get frustrated, and is he going to just whoosh, chop my head off? You know, what is going to happen here? But he, he goes ahead and asks anyway. And the letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So Nehemiah just says, well, here we are. I guess we're just going to ask for everything we need. And he said, by the way, and not just a letter to the, to the people to escort me over to Judah, but I need a letter to Asaph that's in charge of the king's forest. All the wood and all the resources of the king. And, and I need to go into the forest and get all the wood and all the rock and all the stone and all the sand and everything that I need to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Uh, will that be okay, king? <laughs> You ought to underline that in verse 8. And the king granted me. How come? According to the good hand of my God upon me. Now, a lot of us, if we were writing this, we would come back and write in our memoir or our notebook. We would say, man, I talked the king into giving me all the wood and all the stone. Man, look at that. I'm so, I mean, I'm a salesman. I'm smooth. But Nehemiah knew better. And he'd been praying revival prayer for three months. He knew exactly where this came from. And let me tell you, if we will continue to pray revival prayers. Now, it's not just last Sunday night. Please understand, last Sunday night was great. But that's not going to get the job done. If we're going to rebuild God's house, we need to keep praying revival prayers. Keep on trying to have a burden. Keep on confessing our sins. Keep on basing our prayers on the promises of God. You're going to have to keep on. It's not going to happen overnight. As a matter of fact, I didn't see that our church was completely rebuilt and that we were running 500 or something. We had five saved this morning. Whoa, preacher, but we prayed revival prayer last Saturday, Sunday night. Uh, yeah, I know. But Nehemiah prayed for 90 days. We may have to pray for a year. It doesn't matter how long. Just understand that when you begin to pray revival prayers as a group and as a body of Christ, number one, God will provide the means. When you start praying revival prayer and you stop trying to solve the problem yourself, if you're trying to rebuild your Christian life or rebuild your family or rebuild your, uh, your career or whatever you're trying to do for the Lord, and it has to be for God's glory, but if you're trying to rebuild your spiritual life or your family or us trying to rebuild God's house and God's church, if we're going to do that, understand that if you're faithful to, provide, or to pray revival prayers, God will provide the means. Now, I'm just going to get really real with you tonight. We're trying to build the Multiply Worship Coffee Center out there in the Welcome Center. And uh, Brother Mike and I are working together. 
And he's going to graciously, him and Brother Pedro and a lot of other people, I'm sure, are going to get involved in there and, and do all kind of remodel and stuff. And Man, when I got into, I had looked at some prices and I thought I had looked at good prices for stuff. And then we went down to try to order the floor that I wanted that I thought was a good price. And they said, yeah, we can maybe get that by April. Well, we're supposed to be in there drinking coffee by April. And so we found something else that's way nicer, going to last a lot longer, but it's twice as much. And then we're looking at coffee machines and, and equipment and all these things, and, and they're telling me, hey, preacher, if you want to do this right now, we've got to have this, this espresso machine that's going to last, and we've got to do it right, and we've got to have the right kind of impression when we come in, and, and I agree with all those things. But, you know, I was thinking a couple, eight, nine hundred dollars for an espresso machine. You know, the one that we actually need is more like five thousand. Four to five thousand dollars. And so we're looking at all these digital missions to play, and we're just going on and on and on. And, and the, the, the price is going up and up and up and up. And I thought to myself, hey, man, you've got to slow down. Preacher, you can't do all this. We can't go that far. We can't, we can't have that big an outlay. We, we can't do this. And everybody kept saying the same thing. Yeah, but preacher, if we're going to do it right and it's for missions, we've got to do it right. And then I was studying for this. <laughs> and if God called you to do it, he's going to provide the means. And so we're going down to order the expensive floor, and we're going to get the good espresso machine, and we're going to do this thing right because it's going to bring honor and glory to God. Amen? We're going to do it the way God wants us to do it. Now, we're going to be extravagant. We're not going to waste money. But let me tell you, if God's called you to do something, he's going to provide the means. Especially when there's some revival prayer about it. And let me tell you, for years and years, but especially the last two and a half years, I've been praying and praying and praying and diligently searching and wanting the Lord to make us a world mission center and to affect and impact the world, not only outside of the United States, but here in Sherman, Texas, to affect all of the world for the cause of Christ. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that God wants us to do these things, but you know, everybody's human. And everybody has a moment of weakness or a moment of lack of faith, maybe. And if you're trying to rebuild your family or trying to rebuild your Christian life or as us all as a group trying to rebuild God's house, let me tell you, you got to remember that if you're really seeking the Lord and your heart is really in the right place and you've had some time of revival prayer, God will provide the means. Do you understand how crazy it is that a Persian king, Artaxerxes, would just hand over the forest, hand over all the resources to a Jewish guy going over to help a bunch of Jewish captives over in a dilapidated, burnt out city? I mean, that's pretty crazy. But that's what God did. Of course, you all know the verse, Philippians 4. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Well, as we continue along, I see the third, the second point. As we read in verse 9, then Nehemiah says, Then I came to the governors beyond the river. So he got across the river, and he gave them the king's letters. And the king now had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me, so he's very well protected. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant and the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now, we're going to set that aside because that's in the middle of the, of the book of Nehemiah, and we're not going to get there tonight. A couple guys that are already going to oppose this thing. Anytime you do anything for the Lord, there's going to be people that oppose it. Verse 11, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me. Now, it's always been, and the scholars have always been looking at why he went to do this at night. Uh, we don't really know for sure exactly what the reason is. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. 
So he didn't tell anybody in Jerusalem. He didn't tell anybody in Judea. He didn't run out to his family and put it all over social media. Hey, join me as we go look at the walls. We're about to build the walls. No, he didn't say anything about anything to anybody. And as a matter of fact, uh, he just basically has one donkey, one animal that he's riding on. And he doesn't have anything else with him. He's got a couple men. They go in the middle of the night and they go kind of look around the walls to see how bad it is. As a matter of fact, it's so bad, verse 13 says, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the king's, to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. So it's so bad, the, the walls are broken down so bad, that there's a place where he's trying to go by the king's uh, the gate and the, the hall there, where he can't even get across. The rubble and all the, the burnout walls and, and the debris are so bad that he can't even cross. So he gets off the, the animal and begins to, to walk. Then while I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall, and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers know, knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Now, here's what's amazing about this. You know, most of us, if we're going back to rebuild the walls of a city for the Lord, and we've got all the king's resources behind us, and we've got the king's army escorting us across the river, we would plop ourselves down on the highest point of Jerusalem, on, on where the highest pinnacle was, and we'd say, hey, everybody, get around, gather around. Now, let me tell you what we're about to do. We're about to rebuild these walls, man. And the king's giving me this, and we got that, and he, and he would just, normally people would just gather a whole group of all the people, and then they would tell them what's going to happen, and then they'd say, now, let's get doing it. You know that in all those movies back in the old medieval days, when they're going to war, that's what they do. You get all the people together, you give them a little speech, and they go do it. But I think that's where we fail sometimes. You see, because if Nehemiah had stood up on a big pinnacle and gathered everybody together and made some big charge and some courageous speech, then guess what? All the people would have went out. Some of the people would have went out. I don't think it would have been near as many. Some of the people would have went out, and they'd have built the wall for Nehemiah. And see, I'm not going to do that. As we rebuild our church and rebuild God's house after this global pandemic, I'm not going to come out and try to charge y'all up and get y'all all with a courageous speech. And, hey, let's go. Let's do it. Come on. And guess what? Then I have to be your cheerleader all the time. And you're building God's house for me. Hey, preacher said we got to do this. Let's go do this. No, uh, what happened here is that God gave the people directly the vision. Watch. He didn't talk to any of the rulers, didn't talk to the priests, didn't talk to the nobles, didn't talk to anybody that did the work. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates are ever burnt with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. God provided the vision. God gave them the impetus. God gave them the, the, yes, of course, Nehemiah had to share uh, what was going on. Yes, he had to tell them. But he didn't stand up on some big pile of, of rubble and, and go on and do this big, gigantic speech. He didn't go into town and tell everybody about the whole plan. He just got up and said what he had to say. And then God took over and the people said, let us rise up and build for God's sake. And God gave them the vision. And that's what I want to happen here at Grace and Bible Baptist Church. I want you to get the vision of what God can do in our church for yourself. I want you to say, hey, God told me to go do this. God told me to be a part of this. God told me to work in this area. God told me to work in that area. And if God gives you the vision, through me or otherwise, however it works, if God gives you the vision personally, then all of us can get together to work for God. 
You see, it never lasts very long when everybody's working for the preacher. There have been a lot of ministries that have been carried on by amazing men that were, had amazing oratory abilities. And they were able to gather a crowd. And they were able to enthuse and excite a crowd. And they were able to do these amazing things. But let me tell you, at the end of the day, if you're doing it for a man, it will not last. You see, God's got to give the vision in to each and every one of our hearts of what God could do with Grace and Bible Baptist Church. Do you understand the resources that we have for world missions here? God has brought things from everywhere. It's not a coincidence that my dad is the director of the Global Independent Baptist Missions Office. It's not a coincidence that he retired up here in our church as a member, and now we're the standing church for a missions agency. It's not, a, it's not a, a, some kind of a happenstance that, that I'm a former missionary as your pastor. It's not a happenstance that we're already growing so much in our financial giving. It's not a happenstance that God just seems to collect a whole bunch of really missions-minded people in this church. You see, God is a building. God is assembling. God is putting the things together. And all we've got to do is allow God to give us, all of us, the vision for what he wants to do. And then it won't be about Brother Roy. It won't be about a preacher. It won't be about some fellowship. It won't be about some organization. It'll be about God giving a vision to you and all of us executing the vision that God has in our lives so that we corporately can come together and fulfill the vision that God has for our church. I love the story. I won't go into it and take the time to do it, but in 2 Kings chapter 6, you can look at it later. But Elisha is, is being kind of hemmed in in the text. And a matter of fact, they're surrounded by a gigantic, enormous army. And he has his servant that gets up that morning and he looks around and sees all the enemy in the thousands and thousands and their horses and their chariots. And he says, oh, man of God, we are in trouble. All these people are here to kill you. And hopefully not me is probably what he was thinking. And then Elisha said, prays and he asks God, he says, open his eyes. Let him see what's really going on. And then he opens the, God opens the servant's eyes and he sees the heavenly host all around the hills, all around the top of the hills. And they're numbering in the hundreds of thousands. And he says, oh, I think we'll be all right. That's what I want God to do for our church. I want him to open every single one of your eyes so that you can get the vision from God personally. So you can own it. And we can all work together when God provides the vision. So if we will continue in our revival prayer. God will give the vision to each and every one of us, just like he did in the days of Nehemiah. And lastly, maybe most excitingly, if we continue with revival prayer, and I can't tell you how long, I can't tell you how long we're going to have to pray, I can't tell you how long we're going to have to fast and pray and be in a, in a heart of real revival prayer and confessing our sins and really getting things right and, and having a burden. I don't know how long that's going to last, but however long it lasts, if we'll continue and be faithful with our revival prayers, notice what else happened in verse 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build, so they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now, it's interesting. Now, remember, when, when Nehemiah came into the city, and he went out at night looking at the wall, he had three men with him. Three men and a donkey. And then the donkey couldn't even get over the wall, so... The donkey's pretty worthless. I mean, <laughs> he had three men with him. When we look at the they that God put together, you can look at all of chapter 3 and look at all the people that got together building the wall. But then they also, in chapter 7, verse 66... They give the, the total count of all the people that worked. I wrote it down to be exact. 
42,330. Every single person nearly that came back in the first wave from the captivity of Babylon got involved in the work. It's no wonder they got it done in less than two months. You see what happened here? Nehemiah spent three months in revival prayer, and God turned three people into 42,000 workers for the Lord. Now, let me tell you, God's put a whole bunch of burdens and a whole bunch of things, crazy things in my mind. I'm trying to get it to where we can start 30 churches in the state of Texas by the year 2030. God's already helped us start three last year. But we got a long way to go. But you know what God's doing? He's got a pastor down in El Paso that's praying about getting involved. He's got a pastor down in Houston that is going to get involved. I got another pastor down in Beaumont that's probably going to get involved. Pastor in, uh, out in Longview that may get involved. Pastors out in Lubbock and Amarillo that may get involved. And they're going to be zone directors, and Lord willing, and we're going to get a group of pastors out there in each one of those zones around the state of Texas that want to get involved in church planning. You know what God may have just done? I don't think it's may. I think he did. He just turned one guy into a hundred. One pastor that has a burden to start churches in the state of Texas, he just turned one guy into a hundred. I don't know about you, but it breaks my heart that we haven't had a missionary or a church planner come out of our church. The last church that we started out of this church was Brother Eric Crawford's church that's about to celebrate 30 years. 25, I think. So it's been 25 years ago since we sent out a church planter and we've had a couple missionaries come out of our church since then. We haven't sent, we have some that are kind of on their way since the time I've been here, but nobody that's actually went to the mission field yet. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could send out some church planters from this church? What did Jesus say about that? He said in Matthew 9, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Who calls people? God does. Who enables people? God does. If we want people to come out of our church and be missionaries that we've sent out across the world and that we've sent out to the states of Texas, the state of Texas to start churches, and we want people to go out and do these ministries and we want them to come out of our church, we got to pray. That God would send some people out of our church. You say, well, I'm looking around, preacher, and I just don't see too many people. Well, I'm with you. I'm looking around, and I don't see too many people either. But again, three turned into 42,000. God can call a whole bunch of people out of our church. God could be bringing people right now to our church that are going to go to Bible college and they're going to be missionaries or church planners. We don't know what God's doing, but it's our job to pray and believe God. Third thing I see here in verse 18 is that if we continue with revival prayer, God will provide the workers. God will provide the workers. You say, preacher, I don't know if we got enough workers now after COVID and all the people. Some of the people have left and some of this, some of that. I'm not sure we got enough workers to do everything we're planning on doing. I don't think we do. Just to be honest with you, I don't think we do. But I know somebody who does. If we are faithful to do revival prayer and we trust the Lord, God will provide the workers. He just really will. But you know what happens with us? Sometimes we sit down and we look at all the need if we were going to do what God wanted us to do, the means. And Nehemiah could have sat in the palace of Shushan. He could have sat up there and just said, man, it's going to cost $100 million to rebuild that wall in Jerusalem. Which might be where it would be right now financially for us if we tried to rebuild a wall all around a city. And he might have looked around in the palace and go, man, there's only three guys over here in a donkey. 
how in the world am I supposed to build a wall? I'm just going to have to forget it. Just going to have to forget the vision. We can't, I didn't really hear that from God. I just, I stayed up too late, shouldn't have done that, watched a, a Christian movie, kind of got carried away. It, it really wasn't of God. Now listen, church, there's people all over America doing that. They're giving up the call and the dream that God's placed in their heart because they can't see how they would ever get the means, can't see how they would ever get the workers, can't see how they would ever translate the vision to the people. But I'm telling you that if we'll spend time in revival prayer, God will provide the means. God will give you individually the vision, and God will provide the workers. I want to close with this. I love it because it's the founding pastor of our church. Evangelist John R. Rice once wrote, I once imagined I was in heaven, walking along with the angel Gabriel, I said, Gabe, which I guess Brother Rice could call him Gabe, I wouldn't try to do that, but he said, Gabe, <laughs> what is that big building over there? Gabriel said, you'll be disappointed. Matter of fact, I don't think you want to see it. But Brother Rice insisted. But I insisted, and he showed me floor after floor after floor of beautiful gifts, all wrapped and ready to be sent. Brother Rice said, Gabriel, what are all these? He said, I thought rather sadly, we wrapped these things, but people never prayed for them. And I believe that with all my heart. Every good gift cometh from above. From the Father of lights with whom there is no turning. Can you even imagine all the good things that are stuck up in heaven? God couldn't give them to us because we didn't ask. Let me tell you, church. we got to be consistent and faithful to pray revival prayers. And when we do. God will provide the means, he'll provide the vision, and he'll provide the workers. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, and God, we're so encouraged by the word of God and by the story of Nehemiah. I'm so glad that you included it in the Bible. And God, it's the quintessential book to go to when we need to rebuild not only our lives or our relationship with you or some type of organization, but especially when we consider trying to rebuild and help to be co-laborers with you as you rebuild our church. And Lord, I'm so glad that you never called us to something that you don't enable us to do and provide the means to do it. God, I pray that you'd help us to have a burden and help us to see, Lord, individually, not just me talking all the time about the burden, not just me talking all the time and, and mandating a vision, Lord, but each and every person in our church would feel and see personally the vision, not only of what you want to do with our church, but how they can be a part of it. And Lord, we know that if we'll pray to the Lord of the harvest that you'll send forth laborers into your harvest, you've promised us that. And Lord, I pray even now, as I've been praying for a long time, that you would send, send some missionaries and send some church planners and send some full-time workers out of our church. And Lord, you've been faithful to do that. Pray that you would continue. Lord, just speak to our hearts and help us to see what could be done if we'll continue. And not just for one night, not just for one week, but that we'll continue to pray revival prayers. Would you help us to see what could be done? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.